teacher of gods and human beings, to you, the completely and fully awakened one, the endowed, transcendent, destroyer, and the glorious conqueror, the subduer from the Shakya clan, I prostrate, make offerings, and go for refuge. When the supreme among humans, you were born on this earth, you paid out seven strides and said, I am supreme in this world. To you who are wise then, I prostrate. With pure bodies, form supremely pure, wisdom ocean like a golden mountain, fame that blazes in the three worlds, winner of the best, Lord to you, I prostrate. With this supreme sign, face like the spotless moon, color like gold, to you I prostrate. You are immaculate, three worlds are not. Incomparably wise one, to you I prostrate. The Savior having great compassion, the Founder having all understanding, the field of merit with qualities like a vast ocean, to you the one God, the thusness I prostrate. The purity which makes one free from attachment, the virtue which frees one from the lower realms, the one path, the sublime, pure reality, the that dharma which pacifies that prostrate. And those who are liberated and who also show the path to liberation, the holy field qualified with realization, who are devoted to the moral precepts, to you, the sublime community and any virtue I prostrate. Do not commit any non virtuous actions, perform only perfect virtuous actions, subdue your mind thoroughly. This is the teaching of the Buddha. The star of Raj, the flame of the lamp. An illusion, a drop of dew or a bubble, a dream, a flash of lightning, a cloud, see condition things as such. Do these merits my sentient beings, attain the rank of all seeing, subdue the foe of faults, and be delivered from some sight ocean, perturbed by waves of aging, sickness, and death. Tower, <laughs> Sandy, 
Thus I have heard, once the Blessed One was dwelling in Rashtriya on Vulture's Beach, together with the great assembly of monks and Bodhisattvas. At that time, the Blessed One was totally absorbed in the concentration that examines all phenomena called profound illumination. And at the same time, the Noble Avalokiteshvara and the Bhastrisattva Mahasattva was engaged in the profound practice of the wisdom gone beyond, analyzing the five aggregates by nature and then, through the inspiration of the Buddha, the Venerable Jari Bhattra spoke to the Noble Abhulakateshvara, the Bodhisattva Mahasattva, saying, How should those of good family learn who wish to follow the profound practice of the wisdom Gandhya? Thus he spoke to the Noble Abhulakateshvara, the Bodhisattva Mahasattva replied to the Venerable Jari Bhattra, saying, O Jari Bhattra, whatever son or daughter of good family wishes to follow the profound practice of the wisdom Gandhya, to look at it like this, analyzing the five aggregates by nature empty. Form is empty, emptiness is form. Emptiness is no other than form. Form is no other than emptiness. In the same way, feeling, recognition, karma formation, the consciousness are all empty. Therefore, Shariputra, all phenomena are empty without characteristics. They are unborn and unceasing. They are neither impure nor free from impurity. They neither decrease nor increase. Therefore, Shariputra and emptiness, there is no form, no feeling, no recognition, no karma formations, no consciousness. There is no eye, no ear, no nose, no tongue, no body, no mind. There are no spheres of the eyes, but then no spheres of the mind. There are none of these all the way up to the sphere of mental consciousness. There is no ignorance, nor is the destruction of ignorance. There are none of these all the way up to, there is no old age in death, nor is there destruction of old age in death. Thus there is no suffering, no cause of suffering, no cessation of suffering, and no path. There is no wisdom, no attainment, and no non-attainment. Therefore, Shariputra, because there is no attainment, all bodhisattvas hold to the wisdom Gambia, and because there is no obscurity of mind, they have no fear. Passing utterly beyond falsity, they reach beyond the bounds of sorrow. All the Buddhas who dwell in the three times by relying on the wisdom gone beyond, fully and clearly awaken to unsurpassed, most perfect and complete enlightenment. Therefore, the mantra of the wisdom gone beyond, the mantra of great insight, the unequaled and unsurpassed mantra, the mantra that calms all suffering should be known as the truth, for there is no deception. The mantra of the wisdom gone beyond is proclaimed. O Shariputra, this is how a Bodhisattva Mahasattva should learn the profound wisdom Gambia. Then the Blessed One arose from that concentration and praised the Noble Avalokiteshvara, the Bodhisattva Mahasattva, saying, Very good, very good, O son of good family. It is exactly like that. The profound wisdom Gambia should be practiced exactly as you have said, and then the Tathagatas will rejoice. When the Blessed One had said this, the Venerable Shariputra, the Noble Avalokiteshvara, that whole gathering in the world with its men, God men, and the gods and spirits, their hearts full of joy, praise the words of the Blessed One. So ends the noble discourse on the essence of the wisdom beyond the Dinan, 
And now on this good day, Thursday, where in trainings, in conditioning the mind, we turn our attention to the way of the Bodhisattva, the Bodhicharya Avatara, entering into the behaviors of Bodhisattvas. So ordinarily, we think of behavior in the physical and verbal senses only. The behavior of bodhisattvas is principally following the development of the awakening mind, bodhicitta, the practice in sustaining an attitude invested in the well-being of others. It is an attitude, it is the attitude of the bodhisattva and that which we train in now. Oh, Where the awakening mind of Bodhicitta has arisen and after, afterwards, when it is conjoined to, always married to any activity and every activity whatsoever, then these behaviors and these activities are the behaviors of Bodhisattva as they are conjoined to, led by the awakening mind of Bodhicitta. So whatever the activity, it is the charya, it is the activity of the bodhisattva. <clears throat> and when it is the activity of the bodhisattva, it is cause for unparalleled bliss. <laughs> The second chapter of the Bodhisattva Avatara on confession describes on describes offerings that are ordinary. No, no. <clears throat> Offerings of two two kinds. Ordinary offerings and unexcelled offerings. Offerings become unexcelled offerings when they are directed by the awakening mind bodhicitta. So the explanation of what is the unexcelled offering is that offering which is paired with the awakening mind bodhicitta. And this is the sense of the unexcelled offering. Unexcelled meaning none surpass it, that it is unparalleled, that among all offerings it is the best offering of all for the reason that it is conjoined to the awakening mind, Bodhicitta. Oh, <laughs> 
आने को चुप बाती कांदर रांगला देवा चिंबा मातो दुंगे चिंगा की तुझे कांदर तुझे टेक मार कोकब टेक मार चिक से ये बात है ना चालू से भी सिंबे की चुप बात चुप बात खाली चुप बात इनाया कोई भी जीवुदी सेह योमार जोर दो योमार को कांदर ये पेह दो है ना मार सेह दो है योमार चेसा चा� Dewa, ya, pergi tu kan, tu dewa mana tin tu kan, tu tu yang mana. Kalau sana kau coba tinggal sebab, sebab tinggal sebab je buat la, dewa mana tu ni yang mana, tu ni dia sebab mana. Kau tu ini ya pergi tu kan, tu mana sebab mana. Oh, tu ni dewa ini zaman, tu coba sambo ini zaman kau la. Ani cakap tu sebab coba sebab tu sih dia yang resmi. Ani cakap tu sebab coba sebab why are these offerings described as unexcelled offerings? Unexcelled in the sense that they are surpassed by none other, that they are unparalleled. How is it so? It is so for the reason that conjoined to the awakening mind, the merit of the offering, the meritorious activity and whatever the offering becomes cause, is cause only for ever increasing well-being for oneself. Never will one encounter as its result pain and suffering, but only invariably an increase in bliss. And for the reason that conjoined with the awakening mind, bodhicitta, the offering, the activity, whatever it is, its consequence and result is always that in increase in bliss, never waning, always increasing. And when it is always increasing, then the result becomes, is characterized as inexhaustible, where the consequences are of bliss that is inexhaustible. And when this comes from the awakening mind, then offerings that are conjoined with the awakening mind come to be known as unexcelled offerings. It's very interesting. <laughs> When अरे को अगर जेबुची में चाहिए तो भी तो इस नाम से जोड़ दो चाहिए उससे में सिंबे के ये वाली जेबुची इंसान है ना मां तो जोड़ रहे हैं तब ये पहले में तो मां तो आया ये बात जितना तेरे के क्या बात सीख लिया रहे हैं सुनो वेर एन ऑफरिंग अ मेरिटोरियस एक्शन इज नॉट कपल्ड विथ the awakening mind of bodhicitta, then the merit is finite. After a certain period, it goes into decline and does not increase afterward. Whatever the root of virtue, the virtuous root, when it yields its result, its consequence, then that consequence is exhausted, the underlying roots of virtue are exhausted. So is the case where an action is not conjoined to the awakening mind of bodhicitta, but where it is, then the result, though yielding, only continues to yield ever more with ever greater increase. <laughs> ऐ मालूम जो होता है चंदू से मौसी के बाद मालूम जो लगता है इस काबू लगा के ऐ वो नहीं आया अन्य चंदू के से मुझे सिमट चाहिए वो तो ऐसे होते हैं। Now for us, for our part, though to actually give rise to authentic bodhicitta is exceedingly difficult. Nevertheless, we may direct our actions with such a mind. Oh yeah, I think I'm just about to ask that. 
那三十分钟，这这几个人吃一顿啊，吃一顿，反正吃过一顿，三十分钟多少菜了吧？这那等于你打，反正吃过来是哪？那哪里？哪个？你先给三个蛋，吃过来一顿，咋？哪里多呢
the benefits of such an intention, then one finds all the merit that stems from it. So then, on any given day, when whatever the labor is, whatever the activity is, when it is definitely led by the awakening mind, bodhicitta, then that day's labor, that day's activity is cause for immeasurable bliss. It does eliminate pain and suffering, physical pain and mental pain. This is the advantage from the awakening mind bodhicitta conjoined to every action. Then in one day and in the next and in the month and the year, gradually the, the mind comes to be filled with great bliss. Now this is how to refine one's intention when they set forth to listen to Tara. Not only is our subject conjoining the awakening mind, bodhicitta, to our activity, but to I'll turn our attention now to the advantages of bodhicitta as they are described in the Guru Puja, seeing the chronic, seeing that the chronic disease of self-cherishing is the cause of my unwanted suffering. Inspire me to put the blame where blame is due and vanquish the great demon of clinging to self. Mm -hmm. Ordinary notions of harm and injury in the ordinary sense are the exaggerated result of a kind of discursive thought that will have every harm and every injury inflicted by another external to oneself, always coming from outside. This feeling is very strong in us, conditioned by a habit of discursive thought about it. Oh, 
Kese ti ye dila. Pa ti yong goya ki ti zin ki tsawa ti emi ta. Rang chin zi ti ki tu ba le. Rang chin zi ti me na. Shen ji rang la dne ba ti ya yong gu ma le. Rang ki pa mi la dite ki ne u tu san ta nam do ti ya yong ma le. Ti ye kang ka. Rang chin zi ti ki wang ki chung wa le. Es ti su. The anxieties, the mental disquiet of always assuming injury comes and is inflicted by something external hinges on cherishing oneself. When one does not cherish themselves, then no injury is met with. The injury, the harm, supposedly done to oneself, is the consequence of a kind of discursive thought. Without the mind that cherishes itself, conceptual thought attributing harm to others is absent. Then it is observed that self-cherishing is a chronic disease. A chronic disease, like cancer is a chronic disease. Chronic with no recovery, so long as one has cancer, one is in pain. So long as one cherishes themselves, one is in pain. <clears throat> And <laughs> Self-cherishing, the pathology of self-love, causes all undesirable physical pain and all undesirable mental anxiety, all of the discord in the world, all of the distrust between individuals, all the sickness they experience, and all strife has its original cause in the pathology of cherishing oneself. And so it is observed, chronic disease of self-cherishing is the cause of unwanted suffering. With this recognition then, the practice with such an understanding is what is urged in the, in the verse. <laughs> Then 
啊，你让经济变得通了，让经济这个带中央银行有把钱把钱呢？啊，你把这这个让经济当今对现实，把这个让经济变得那么让那么经济变得那么那么经济变得那么那么经济变得那么那么经济变得那么那么经济变得那么
What is the attitude which cherishes another? What is this attitude? <coughs> this attitude is the commitment to establishing all others in a state of well-being and of using the achievement of the state of Buddhahood as the means to establishing those beings in their well-being. This attitude is the mind that it cherishes another. What properties does it have? It is the very gateway to infinite excellence. <clears throat> <clears throat> Devotion, <laughs> Infinite excellence is the sum of all the gratification and satisfaction from the slightest physical sense of well-being and the slightest mental sense of well-being all the way upwards and through to every last of the Buddha's extraordinary qualities. All of these have their cause in the mind which cherishes others, recognizing that the attitude to cherish others is the gateway to all excellence then when confronted with another who is disliked or who would injure us, to review, reverse one's perspective, to cherish them as more valuable than one's own life. This is urged upon one in this verse. Why, <laughs> The ordinary
the ordinary value of the human life, the ordinary conception of the human life and the prospect of losing one's life is that to lose one's life is the greatest misfortune and the greatest pain. And to avoid losing one's life, one will spare no expense and even sacrifice others. Why is it that one's own life comes to be so valuable? However, it does become so valuable. This would provide for us the example of the measure of value so that when we meet with another who would do us harm, whoever they might be, we would value them as being of value, even surpassing the value of our own life. And so this ought to be applied to one's practice. Oh, yeah, said that that hanging, never genuine hanging, the buggy hung, Mago, Tinny, and this is the sort of chevron single race. But you think of Chavan is. The boy cousin is single race. Send out to what you legged it, to what you legged it. Oh, it's not that deep to what it is, to what it lays on up. That courage in it is that to what it lay on it. The round, they want to be your day, they want it, or that round, tell the same. Why, though, when we meet one who injures us, why would we value them in such a way, such that they would be to us more valuable than our own lives are to us? Why would we think in this way the doubt is natural? The question will arise. The uncertainty will arise. What, why? And the reason is, that we wish for well-being. And all well-being stems from cherishing others, and especially another who might do us harm when they are cherished. This becomes cause for our well-being. <clears throat> And <laughs> And secondly, that which actually inflicts pain, that which is actually source of pain and suffering, is an afflicted mind, the klesha of mental afflictions. <laughs> and the klesha of mental afflictions emerge from
grasping and holding to a self, a personal self. Afflicted minds and the grasping at the personal self must be treated so they are eliminated. And best treatment for the elimination of afflicted minds rooted in grasping at a personal self is to, sh to cherish, is the attitude which cherishes others. Where the attitude to cherish others is present, it is able to treat the grasping at the personal self and the afflicted minds which develop from it. Therefore, the attitude that cherishes others eliminates afflictions and bestows well-being. So it is. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I describe the treachery, perilousness of the pathology of cherishing the self and the advantages of the attitude to cherish others. With the observation of the passing of Ama Yudrin, Adrian La, to observe this, her passing, now I describe the. Where the awakening mind of Bodhicitta is refined in this way and prayers are made. And when they are followed then by the recognition of self-cherishing as pathological and cherishing others as the constructive attitude of the bodhisattva, then there is no difference between this refined intention and its instantiation through the recognition of the pathology of self-love and the advantage of cherishing others and the very way of the bodhisattva itself whether it would be to develop the awakening mind that one thinks along these lines, or it were that one had already developed the authentic mind of awakening and thinks along these lines, there would be no difference between the two, in fact. <laughs> Ta 
Lo The pathology of self-cherishing, the advantages of the attitude of cherishing others, these are informed by our understanding of what the mind is. And one understands these as attitudes in order to develop their practice. The pathology of self-cherishing, the advantageous attitude of cherishing others, these attitudes, they are minds, they are understanding, whatever we call it, consciousness, awareness, mind. These are various names and each works as well as the other. Now, in states of conscious awareness, again, as I have reiterated, now last week as well, those states of conscious awareness range from coarse to subtle. One presentation describes conscious awareness as of two kinds. Consciousness as it, as it is innately and states of conscious awareness that are merely supervenient or adventitious. Oh, yeah. That he did. Lubu, same city, same shagbat, shagbat. You may same city, same chamot shaggy or essence. That which is supervenient or adventitious is the coarser state of conscious awareness. The innate consciousness, the subtle. Innate consciousness is a conscious awareness which is inherited from the past and present in a continuum. The supervenient states of conscious awareness or the adventitious states of conscious awareness arise and cease, arise and cease.
桑啊，呃呃，送你妹。啊，对，送你妹，送你妹，送你妹，送你妹。对啊。进 secret mantra 呀，那 subtle moving winds and subtle mind are characterized, and their characterization is connected to this range in states of conscious awareness from. Subtle to gross. Ah, ah, yeah. Sim, ragwa, sim, ragwa. Thila yang pran nansi ki chara kare. Bas she yandu. That thanda mago omba ni she yake sim ta ragwa ta chamo she yake jeshi jana sim onzi chidu onzi chile la bu yobati sim ragwa se onzi chidu thamba onzi onzi ka bu yobati la an sim chamo. <clears throat> Within such a presentation, in a characterization of coarse states of conscious awareness, coarse states of conscious awareness, these two will range from coarser to subtler, and that range is described in terms is described according to the Avadharma in which when I when a state of conscious awareness is involved in recognition and the recognition is comparatively straightforward, then that state of conscious awareness is coarser. When the recognition, when the recognition is not so easy, in the media, it is a subtler state of conscious awareness. Oh, yeah, I don't know. You know, that's true, that we're not, but the one that actually, yeah, to see devil in us. I'm an answer, so good, that's a good, so good, and you know, that's a good, so good, which I see now, career, so. And it didn't do shit. Didn't do shit. Ini nampak siapa, nampak tu tak? Tujuh orang tu, tujuh orang tu, tujuh tang tu, orang tu lagi apa? Oh, di sot, pemungan, biarlah, soa, tuisi, tuisi, nampak siapa? Nampak oh, di lepas jalan siapa? Nas, antara anda segera setuju atau tidak? Sup solo, di sini, nampak siapa? Wah, sudi jauh mana? Nampak sudi, si si dengan si sudi, si dewa, nampak sudi si dewa. In the identification of course states of conscious awareness, which themselves are arranged from coarser to subtler states of conscious awareness, we may first look at the skandhas themselves as coarse. And needless to say, a skandha, the aggregate of form as external form is Course. This leaves the four remaining skandhas of feeling, sensation, discrimination, karmic formations, and consciousness. Oh, yeah. Then, 
Now, in the five skandhas, the five aggregates, if we were to ask, are some of the aggregates coarser than other aggregates which are subtler? The answer would be yes. And how, how so? Now, the, the range from coarse to fine, coarse to subtle, may apply to objects and to object cognizing. Z. But here we haven't got to concentrate on this distinction, but rather simply on these five aggregates, supposing they're one's own five aggregates, among these five aggregates, is there a range in there, a range among them from coarse to subtle? There is, as they are, leaving out first the aggregate of form. The second aggregate is feeling. Now, as feeling is more easily recognized then the third skanda, discrimination, feeling is coarser. 
discrimination as it is more difficult to identify and recognize than feeling is subtler. And karmic formations are still more difficult to recognize and identify, classifying them as subtler still. And most difficult to identify is consciousness, the aggregate, making it in the range the subtlest. <clears throat> oh, yeah. <clears throat> Therefore, feeling is identified as coarser than consciousness because it is more readily recognized and consciousness is classified as subtler than feeling because it is more difficult to recognize and identify the classification comes down to the difficulty in the recognition of the Agri. <laughs> Here then in the range in the skandhas from coarse to subtler, feeling coarser than discrimination, discrimination coarser than karmic formation, and karmic formations coarser than that subtlest aggregate consciousness, the classification or the identification of their Relative coarseness depends upon the difficulty of making their recognition, recognizing the, the aggregate, the skanda. <clears throat> so why is what motivates the range among the skanda, among the aggregates from coarse to subtle? The difficulty involved in identifying them. <clears throat> Well, <laughs> And when asked to characterize feeling, it is all readily apparent to us that feelings are pleasant, unpleasant, or, or neutral. It's readily apparent to us how we feel. When one asks, how do you feel? It's easy enough for us to identify how we feel and to say, well or unwell. So it's sensible and easily recognizable. <clears throat> uh, and daily, and daily, whatever we do, there's a feeling that goes along with whatever it is we're doing. Well, 
<laughs> and then it, anything that goes on daily, it's how it feels is really apparent when we go outdoors and the weather is fine. Then the good weather makes us feel very well, very comfortable when we eat. And it is a good meal, then we feel, feel good. And we can indicate how we feel to another, and they too will readily understand what it is to feel that way. And then when the weather's bad and we and when the weather's bad then we are in discomfort, we are uncomfortable, or when we eat food that doesn't agree with us, then we feel unwell, or when we meet someone we wish we prefer not to meet, then we think, oh, unfortunately, I've met with this person, they're here, and are displeased. All of these states and how we feel are easy for us to identify. There's no difficulty in the recognition of what the feeling is. And for that reason, this aggregate may be identified as coarse. Oh, so then among the aggregates, the aggregate of feeling is relatively coarse. The feeling itself is of the tonality, pleasant, unpleasant, and neutral. Among these tonalities, pleasant and unpleasant are coarser, the neutral state subtler. <clears throat> Relatively subtler than the aggregate of feeling is the aggregate of discrimination. Discrimination which involves identifying a given individual and then discerning properties to them, such as their having wealth. This discrimination is, in terms of recognizing and identifying discrimina discrimination itself, more difficult to recognize. Therefore, it is subtle. <laughs> Do you 
మేతి దేశింపులే మేతి శక్తి కో దేశ కో దేవాలయ సమాజకు దుష్యబద్ధ చేసారవా దుష్యబద్ధ తెలి దుష్యబద్ధ దుష్యబద్ధ ఉంది దుష్యబద్ధ తెలిపి చేపట్టి ดุชเชบะกิเจกิพะกิเจดิกิสุเดลิเนกิเดยบะตุฮะเดตะตะมอนโรเซวะตะกะเดพุกิจาวะดิกิสุดุตุบะตัมตุบะชิกิเซวะ
where the qualities of a thing, of an individual, their wealth, or whatnot, is discriminated through the aggregate of discrimination. The accounting for what the accounting for and the demonstrating how those properties or qualities emerge in our present that which clarifies how that which is discriminated and recognized is and recognized how it is so how it becomes so this is the karmic formations and the karmic formations and the aggregate of consciousness are in texts described in this manner while discrimination discriminates karmic formations and consciousness illuminate with greater clarity This way of describing, characterizing karmic formations invites a a close resemblance between discrimination itself and karmic formations, where they wouldn't seem to be different at all. But what the karmic formation that is more difficult to recognize than, than the aggregate of discrimination is specifically concordant karmic formations. And these concordant karmic formations are of the kind, I will be well, I will bring about well-being for others. This concordant karmic formation is indeed more difficult to identify than the aggregate of discrimination and for this reason is classified as subtle. 
And the aggregate of consciousness itself, which is subtlest, is mere awareness. And as mere awareness of an object, indeed more difficult to recognize. So then the five aggregates of form, feeling, discrimination, karmic formations, and consciousness, if considered in this way, when considered in this way, don't really invite any confusion or misunderstanding. They all follow in the understandable way. And now we will conclude here as time has passed. And if there are any questions, we can address them in the Q&A. Uh, no questions, then we go on our holiday. Simsin, Shamba, La, and the Dundat Rubella, and 
Johnson ke gro sat ina nejung de so so la se wa yo be want ta ne nejung ke gro ta de chenzin ta nejung ke kap nejung ke be kap de la ne chenzin de chenzin de chenzin ma yo de ganis cha gre chik che so cha so Nijungi <laughs> Ta <laughs> I'll, I'll address the, the I'll, uh, I'll address the first question here and uh, following from the 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 disadvantage to self grasping and the advantage of cherishing others that is all pain follows from the pathology of Self cherishing and all good follows from the attitude cherishing others. Now, regarding renunciation, while it might be plausible to think of renunciation in terms of self cherishing, renunciation involves actually recognition of the peril of samsara and it is renunciation that becomes in its recognizing the peril of samsara becomes basis and foundation for the mind the attitude which cherishes others compassion requires renunciation the cause of compassion and the cause of the attitude which cherishes others of that attitude is renunciation. Now, in your question, you identified the mind, the self cherishing mind, with renunciation. <clears throat> and that is you identified the self-cherishing mind which is the self-cherishing mind that is cause of all pain with renunciation and there must be observed the great significant difference indeed between 
the mind which cherishes itself and renunciation. And while there is the pursuit of personal liberation, that is an extension of self cherishing, while there is such a pursuit of individual, personal liberation, renunciation involves the acknowledgement of the perils of pain and samsara and is the desire for liberation from that pain. <clears throat> There is in the Bodhisattva's mind, in the Bodhisattva's mind, the mind of renunciation, and that mind in the Bodhisattva's mind is not a mind of self cherishing. <clears throat> the second question. <laughs> Mm-hmm. Yin they are. They are. Cogit, you The response to the second question would be similar to the response to the first. In offerings that are made from a self-generated deity to a front-generated deity, and in the mandala when <clears throat> front-generated deities and others make offerings 
towards the self-generated deity and all of the activities involved in the mandala. mandala. <clears throat> they are all, by definition, exclusively reinforcing the attitude which cherishes others and never, by definition, participating in self-cherishing. And it is by definition so because these, the activities in the mandala have as their motivating cause the deliverance of all sentient beings into the state of contented well-being. And as these activities are caused for just this, they cannot participate in <coughs> self-cherishing. <laughs> The <laughs> <clears throat> in the Samaya of the Mantrayana, they, these Samaya, the commitments, are specifically for the purpose of developing insight and realization as rapidly as possible. And one pursues the rapid development of insight in order to protect others from pain of suffering and all of the activities which go on in the mandala, all of the activities of producing the inestimable mansion and making offerings and of requesting city, these are all for the purpose of developing realization rapidly. One needs the, the power to provide protection to others. And in order, as the means for developing the power to provide protection to others, one engages in these activities. <laughs> these are not part of a pursuit of personal, finding personal satisfaction. <clears throat> and so they are not involved in an attitude which cherishes the self. <laughs> not cause for pain and suffering, therefore not the attitude of cherishing oneself. Now we'll recite our closing prayers because time has come for that. Debe <laughs> Rangi 
that I have amassed from working with effort at this practice for a great length of time. May I become the chief leading Buddha for all those whose mind with the mind blinded by you. Even if I do not reach this state, may I be held in your loving compassion for all my life. May I find the best of the path of the complete teachings, and may I please all the Buddhas by practicing. Using skillful means drawn by the strong force of compassion, may I clear the darkness from the minds of all beings, with the points of the path as I have discerned. May I hold Buddha's teachings for a very long time. With my heart going out with great compassion, in whatever direction the most precious teaching, if not yet spread or once spread have declined, may I offer this treasure of happiness to it all sentient beings. May the minds of those who wish for liberation be granted bounteous peace, and the Buddha's need be nourished for a long time by following the complete graduated path of enlightenment and the wondrous virtuous conduct of the Buddha and their son. May all human and non-human beings and eliminated persons make things conducive for practicing the excellent path, never be parted in any of their lives from the purest path praised by the Buddha. Whenever someone makes effort to act in accordance with the tenfold Mahayana virtuous practices, may I always be assisted by the mighty ones and may oceans of prosperity spread you. Dogage, <laughs> Chandra <laughs> I dedicate whatever virtues I've ever collected for the benefit of the teachings and of sentient beings, and in particular for the essential teachings of Venerable Bhagavan Rapha the Shine Forever. In a land encircled by snowy mountains, you are the source of all happiness and good. All powerful sinners who tend to gamble, please remain in this life if you miss the sin. Just as the brave Mantra Sri and the Mantavatra too, realize things as they are. Also, I dedicate all these merits in the best way that I may follow the perfect example. And dedicate all the roots of virtue with the dedication praised as the best by the victorious Tuscan ones three times so that I might perform the noble Bodhisattva deed. May the supreme jewel of Bodhisattva, that is not a risen arise and grow. And may that which has arisen not diminish, but increase more and more. Thank you all, and good night to you all. Yeah. Yeah.